God is with us, here we find new life. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. I am Pastor George Harris. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning, joined uh, as I almost always am by my esteemed colleague and friend, Reverend Kevin Weichel, known affectionately to many as Rev Kev. Uh, many know me as Pastor George, but you can call either of us as you please. Uh, it's always a joy to be together in worship, whether you are worshiping here in person or whether you are worshiping at home. Um, it matters not, really. Uh, we love to have a sanctuary with people in it. It's a joy indeed, but if you're at home, you are just as important to us and just as much a member of this body of Christ, the church. I had a classic COVID moment in the narthex before the service. Uh, my Glasses were fogging up, and one of our members walked in with uh, absolutely, like, like couldn't see anything, glasses fogged up, and we kind of like squinted through our fogged up glasses and thought we looked vaguely familiar and just greeted, greeted each other warmly. Uh, one of the blessings and curses of being a minister is that everything becomes a metaphor. So, uh, <laughs> in fact... The Apostle Paul says something in 1 Corinthians 13 about uh, now we see through the glass darkly, but uh, then we will see face to face. And um, my wish this morning is that we all see each other face to face, just as we are, just as we come before God. No fog in our glasses whatsoever. So, Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you. If you are here for the first time, I would let you know that we are a member church of the denomination, the United Church of Christ. Uh, you might Google ucc.org, and if you're not familiar, get some good information about the denomination. Uh, we are an open and affirming congregation, which means we seek to be welcoming of everybody, uh, regardless of the journey you're on, regardless of your gender identity, sexual orientation, race, marital status, level of education, uh, level of prosperity. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So again, welcome to each of you here and welcome to all of you at home. Let us be together in prayer. Bountiful God, you have blessed us with so many gifts in this time of worship, may we be open to receiving these gifts. Help us claim our gifts and use them to bring liberation and justice to a hurting world. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. May the transforming spirit of joy and unity bind us together as your body, that we may be your hands and feet and voice in this, your world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Spirit of God is upon us. The Spirit of God is upon us. Come, let us worship God, who binds us together in love and service. Sing and 
Every once in a while, someone will say to us, you know that confession thing we do each week? That is a real downer. And I have to say, you know, there was a time I used to feel the same, but I have come to experience this time in worship as freeing because we're just admitting that we're not perfect and we're asking God uh, to enter our imperfections and walk with us in the week ahead. So let's pray together our unison prayer of confession with open hearts and open minds. Ever-present one, you call us to be your presence, your body in this world, but too often we get caught up in being a hand or a foot and lose sight of the overarching mission you set before us. We fracture into pieces. We go our separate ways, forgetting we need each other to be whole. You have given us your law to be our guide, but we turn our backs on what we see as rules and restrictions, fearful that we will not live up to your expectations. Help us to see with new eyes and hear with the ears of our heart the liberating spirit of the law that strengthens and revives and enables us to be and do all you call us to be and do. O God of liberation and justice, help us be faithful witnesses to your law of love and unity. Amen. The Spirit of God is upon us. God has called us to bring good news and liberation to the poor, to the marginalized, and to all who are in need anywhere. God's joy is our strength. Through God, we can do all things. God's Spirit surrounds us and forgives us and loves us. Amen.
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 
On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no distension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are truly, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. my home, one of our favorite TV shows to watch as a family is the Netflix reality show, Queer Eye. Here, five accomplished gay men, each with a particular expertise, team up to help someone whose life has somehow taken a turn for the worse. Maybe this person hasn't recovered from the loss of a spouse, or they lack confidence in themselves, or are just failing to thrive in their life. A friend or family member nominates or recommends this loved one to receive help from the Fab Five. Each man of the Fab Five has unique gifts to contribute. There is Jonathan, the hairstylist, Antony, a food and wine expert and chef. Karamo, culture expert and life coach. Tan, fashion designer and consultant. And Bobby, an accomplished interior designer. The group itself is diverse. Jonathan is non-binary and often wears a dress. Antony, or rather Karamo, is black. And Tan is Pakistani and was raised Muslim. Of course, they are all made for TV gorgeous. Each episode of this year's season six is filmed in Texas and features Texans. In one episode that Lourdes, Abby, and I recently enjoyed, the Fab Five shows up at a shipping container that 32-year-old rancher Josh Eilers calls home. A little rough around the edges, Josh joined the army at age 17 and found himself as a team leader in Afghanistan by age 20. Though Josh now runs a successful business, he never really learned the life skills necessary to care for himself. 
He was nominated to receive a helping hand from the Fab Five by his ex-girlfriend, Kayla, the woman Josh considers as the one that got away. I won't give you the whole play-by-play, -play, but in an early scene, they ask Josh to take off the cowboy hat that he wears from the time he gets out of bed in the morning to the time he lays his head down at night. And his hair is a matted, greasy mess. And Jonathan sets to work shampooing Josh's hair, which is so dirty that it turns the water in the sink brown. Now, though scenes like this might prompt a grimace or a groan, the subjects of Queer Eye are never judged. Quite the opposite, they are dubbed the story's heroes. In just three days, the Fab Five reset the hero's life, helping them find clothing and a hairstyle that both, both matches their personality while being fashionable. Antony teaches them how to prepare a simple, healthy, delicious meal. And Bobby remakes their living space in a way that reflects the best of the hero's life. Karamo coaches the hero both to affirm their gifts while opening them to the possibility of a better life. Of course, Josh turns out to be a total sweetheart. He has had no experience with gay men, but decides to trust the Fab Five, opens himself to the makeover experience, and opens his heart to talk about his life. In addition to having a complete hair, clothing, food, and home makeover, See if we, you know, okay, there we go. So that's, uh, that's Bobby and Jonathan, oh, on Karamo on the left, Bobby, Jonathan, uh, that's Josh in the middle, post makeover, and Tan and Anthony. So there, there they all are. Josh confesses his limitations and regrets that he never apologized to Kayla for the mistakes he made in their relationship. The show ends with the transformed Josh cooking dinner for Kayla in his remodeled shipping container and apologizing. As is often the case, I tear up, touched by the grace and love manifested in these relationships. Josh and the other heroes featured in Queer Eye are no mere recipients of charity. As much as the medium of television will allow, real caring relationships appear to develop between the Fab Five and the episodes subjects, its heroes, and it is the quality of these relationships that are transforming. So except for the notable absence of Jesus, and I'll talk about that in a moment, I suggest that Queer Eye mirrors the model for church represented by Paul in this morning's passage when he talks about the body of Christ. I'll talk about that more in a bit, but let's spend a little time with the first Corinthians text. Beginning about 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, the Apostle Paul travels the Mediterranean, planting churches. Once he sets up a church, Paul moves on to the next city and starts over. But he writes letters back to the churches he founded, often in response to challenges and conflicts they are experiencing. With people coming and going from all parts of the Roman Empire, the port city of Corinth was very diverse and the church Paul founds there reflects that diversity. We can tell from Paul's letter that the church is experiencing some conflict as a result of the differences among its members. There are disagreements about how to practice the sacrament of communion and disagreements about which spiritual gifts are the most important. Some are saying that they are the most important ones in the church because they speak in tongues. Here, Paul addresses that conflict. Paul uses the metaphor of a human body to represent the church, where each part, each member of the body, is necessary for the body to function. Each member of the body is unique, differently equipped. Paul's meaning is clear. All members of the Corinthian congregation are equally important for the full flourishing of the body. Those who try to set themselves above others because they believe they are more gifted, are not only wrong, but, Paul writes, on the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. 
and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member. In verse 21, Paul imagines a scenario in which certain body parts claim no need for the others. While this imaginary scenario may at first seem absurd, Paul is calling out those in the church who are inclined toward radical individualism. For Paul's purposes, individual rights or personal freedoms are anathema to the good of the whole. Paul has been consistent in this message throughout much of 1 Corinthians. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 10, Paul addresses a conflict whereby some members of the Corinthian congregation believe that their personal rights are being violated if they are not permitted to eat meat that had previously been sacrificed to pagan idols. While Paul agrees with these individuals in theory, that is, idols are not real anyway, so who cares if meat has been sacrificed? Paul also recognizes that the issue is a sensitive one for many others in the congregation. Those that are new to Christianity will be confused by this engagement with pagan rites. Thus, he advises against the consumption of such meat for the sake of others, for the common good. This conflict between a spirit of radical individualism and recognition of interconnected interdependence continues to be evident in the world and church today. This is a big deal and lies at the center of much of the political conflict that divides our nation, our communities, and our families today. By what criteria or standard do we make decisions? Individual rights or the needs of the most vulnerable and the common good? Now, our Bill of Rights guarantees individual rights we understand this emphasis on individual rights as foundational to what it means to be an American. But individual rights are not the basis of our faith. Did you hear that? Individual rights are not the basis of our faith. They're just not. Our United Church of Christ sometimes says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, diversity. In all things, charity. Both Jesus and Paul teach that the common good is achieved by putting the needs of the least of these first. If one member suffer, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is the essential belief around which we in the United Church of Christ unify. In the recent COVID pandemic, debates about mask mandates and vaccine mandates demonstrate that this age-old conflict between individualism and the common good still rages. Of course, as a country, our laws must be constitutional as written by our elected legislatures and judged by the courts. But as Christians, our values are grounded in the teachings of Jesus as informed by the Bible. And this teaching that we form communities in which putting the needs of the most vulnerable first leads to our common good, this teaching is foundational. It is essential. The courts can determine which COVID mandates are constitutional, but there can be no doubt what a Christian perspective on these issues is. We get vaccinated and wear a mask because it puts the needs of the most vulnerable first and serves our common good. Paul insists in verse 27, you, this is the plural you, you all, you all are the body of Christ. The Greek pronoun here is an emphatic one that draws attention to the collective identity of the congregation, a congregation endowed with a wide variety of spiritual gifts. And notice what Paul does not say here. He doesn't say you should be the body of Christ or if you don't sin, if you are a better person, then you will be the body of Christ, or some of the most gifted of you are the body of Christ. No, Paul tells the church in Corinth and tells us today, you all are the body of Christ. Simply coming together in faith with our diverse gifts and needs 
with all our imperfections on display, this morning and always, we are the body of Christ. So to circle back to the example of the Fab Five and Queer Eye, they get paid a lot of money to build transforming relationships with the subject, the hero of each episode. That's what keeps them coming back. As members of the body of Christ the church, we are the subjects whose lives are transformed together by following the lead of the Fab One, Jesus Christ. That's what keeps us coming back. Now that said, Jonathan, Antony, Karamo, Tan, and Bobby are still an example to us. They enter, enter into each relationship by identifying the need of the most vulnerable. They may have never read 1 Corinthians, but they pra practice an ethic in which the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that are thought less honorable are clothed, literally, fashionably clothed by tan with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Each of the Fab Five affirms and trusts in the gifts they bring, and they use these gifts to transform the life of the vulnerable one, identified as a hero. Though they are confident in the gifts they bring, they also open their own hearts to be changed. Each episode ends with the Fab Five looking in as their hero leaves the nest and puts into practice all they have learned. There are cheers and tears as hearts swell. So really probably about 20 minutes before this service began, Rev Kev texted me and he said, your sermon title makes me nervous. Uh, my sermon title being, look at this body. So um, um, have no fear, I will remain robed here in the pulpit. Uh, but really, seriously, look at this body. Look at this body of Christ, the church. We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. May we live and act with that knowledge and understanding as we seek to love and serve the most vulnerable among us. Amen.
be seated. I don't know about you, but I am relieved. I am relieved. Thank you. But what a wonderful reminder of each of us, important in the eyes of God as members of this church, and how all of us are important members and contribute in our own individual ways for the collective good. Uh, so what we do now as part of that body of Christ is lift up our prayers and our concerns and our joys with one another uh, because we walk together as the body of Christ. So we start with a celebration. Marge Brown had surgery this past week, and it went well, and she is She's doing great, and she is uh, at home this week, but looks forward to joining us again. Um, so we celebrate with her um, that she is relieved to be through her surgery. We pray strength and healing uh, for uh, Don Skinner. Don had open heart surgery uh, last week, last Monday. Um, there have been some complications, and so he is still at the hospital, and he is in need of prayer. So prayers for Don and for Debbie and for Dan. For Sarah Fleming's father, Richard Rowley, who's in the hospital and in need of healing and strength. Um, and we prayed uh, before for, for Kevin and Terry Carlson's neighbor and good friend, uh, Karen Mola, who is back in the hospital um, after suffering a seizure at home. She's recuperating from a, a liver transplant surgery. And we prayed for her around that time when she had the surgery, and so we'll pray for her again. For Tom Meek, who continues to recover from uh, his open heart surgery, some good news, Tom and Elaine will attempt to come back to Simsbury next week. They have been in Vermont uh, since that time, so we keep Tom and Elaine in our prayers. And for Jennifer Albrecht's father, as he recovers from, from COVID, and uh, we pray for all of those who are sick with symptoms and those who are positive and asymptomatic and especially for those who are high risk, and for parents and caregivers and overburdened teachers and nurses and doctors. Prayers of solace and peace for Roger Holmes, father of Deb Cushman, who is nearing the end of life. And for our community and our world, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Tonga, where estimates are that 80% of the population has been impacted by a volcanic eruption and tsunami and for our siblings uh, in the Ukraine as troops from Russia approach their borders and anxiety of an impending attack arises. We pray for the family of the New York City police officer Jason Rivera who was killed and officer Wilbert Mora who is in the hospital fighting for his life. Uh, both were uh, injured while on duty, shot while on duty and uh, they are the fourth and fifth police officers shot this month in New York. So we pray for all of our police who risk their lives and for economic, environmental, and racial justice throughout our country and world and for peace throughout the land. Uh, for those who are at home, feel free to write prayers in the comments. Uh, for those here, let me ask what additional prayers you have this day. For your sister, who's going to start chemotherapy. Okay, Meredith. For Meredith's sister, prayers for her. Thank you. You can submit a prayer request online. Uh, talk to Pastor George. Talk to myself. Talk to anyone on staff. We'll make sure that it gets on the list. The Lord be with you. Gracious and loving God, we lift to you our prayers. We lift those prayers printed and spoken aloud, prayers for each other, prayers for our community and beyond. We give you thanks for hearing them. Listening, God, as we travel life's winding roads, we call out to you. We come to you with thanksgiving and gratitude for friends and for family, for life's milestones for the smile of a stranger. And we also call out to you for healing and for hope. If we're being honest, Lord, we are overwhelmed at times with so much sickness and grief, tragedy and violence, selfishness and dishonesty. Sometimes we feel paralyzed as we look for good news. Holy One, help us to remember that you are good news for our lives. Help us to center ourselves, our hearts, our minds on you. We are grateful for 
your care. We're grateful that in these times you hear our cries. We ask you to be our healing. We pray today especially for all victims of tragedy close to home and far away. We pray for healing and for peace, for nations and for those in authority. Pray for justice in all the world, for the health of those who suffer in mind and body and spirit, for the needs of families, single people, and the lonely, for forgiveness for those we find hard to forgive, and for all who are oppressed or in prison. God of the present moment and of the future, we pray for a vision that will draw us closer to you and your ways in the world. Strengthen us to seek new ways of being your people, daring to follow and to create community in your name. May our thinking be renewed and our souls enlarged. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Some announcements. With the cold temperatures comes a need for socks, hats, gloves, hand and foot warmers um, at the Simsbury Senior Center, Elizabeth House Shelter, South Park Inn, Hansel and Hartford and Covenant to Care. Uh, so a bin for donations is uh, outside Palmer Hall on the bench. It will be there through February 4th. So if that is something you could help out with, um, just come on by, drop them off in the bin. It would be much appreciated. Today, our junior fellowship, which is uh, those who are in 6th uh, through 8th grade, they're ice skating uh, at Simsbury Farms from 1245 to 145. There'll be hot chocolate. Uh, Pilgrim Fellowship uh, meets tonight. That's the high school youth group for those in 9th through 12th grades. It's the second session on the series, Let's Get Mental. Tonight, we'll be talking about stigma and also, as happens at youth group, playing games as well. We'll be in Palmer Hall. Um, speaking of that group, the summer youth mission trip registration opens February 1st, so be prepared for that. Information went out uh, this past week, and there will be more coming this week ahead of February 1st. The trip will be with service learning camps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, book and Bible studies uh, on Sunday morning at 8.30 and also Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. As we've discussed, the Wednesday morning group is a lectionary study focusing on the scripture for the Sunday sermon, and uh, the Sunday morning group is a book study. Uh, for any information, for more information, for updates and news on what's going on here at the church, there is always a lot going on. It's a busy, busy place, which is a great thing. Uh, you can go to the main page, the, to, to the home page, and then just click latest news, and there you will see uh, the, the last weekly email um, and the cornerstone and all the information you need. Uh, any questions as well, you can email or call the church office. Uh, so a couple additional items. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, that Don Skinner continues in the hospital. Um, and in reaching out uh, to Debbie, I just asked, how can we support you? And some of you may know that uh, they have um, a young adult son, Dan, uh, with special needs. And Dan works at Stop and Shop. And with Debbie uh, going over to uh, the hospital, um, she will sometimes need 
rides for Dan to bring him home. It's about a, a three-mile trip to bring him from Stop and Shop to home. And so Marianne Marchio, has, who has a, just a wonderful relationship with the Skinners, has offered to be the person to organize those rides. So if you are interested in, in helping that with, with that, um, and, and maybe uh, being somebody that could, could provide a ride on Mondays, for example, or on Thursdays, you know, please contact uh, Marianne. Um, and um, if, if you don't know Marianne, you can, you can call the church office and they'll get you in touch. But Marianne is, is right here, uh, so you can talk to her after church or uh, be in touch with her through email, uh, whatever works. So uh, it would be really good to help them out. Uh, stop and shop in Granby. Yep, stop and shop in Granby. Yep. So um, I don't know if you know, um, but uh, Pastor George is famous. He was uh, on NBC 30 this week with a, a fantastic interview. And, um, you know, with these monitors here and, and all this tech, um, we, can, we can watch it. We can watch the interview. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do, this, do this right now because it really was wonderful. As the nation celebrates civil rights icon, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are learning more about his connection to Connecticut. We love to tell that story. Back in 1947, King and other students from Morehouse College arrived in Connecticut. As a part of a tuition assistance program, they worked in the tobacco fields. King attended the First Church of Christ in Simsbury, and on one Sunday morning... The choir director heard a beautiful baritone voice coming up from the floor of the church, and he said, who is that? Invite that person up here. And they said, oh no, that's just one of the tobacco workers, by which they meant that's a black man, that wouldn't be somebody we would normally invite up. But for a predominantly white church in the era of Jim Crow, the choir director would make a move that stunned even King. That choir director said, I don't care about the color of his skin, as long as he can sing, invite him up. He wrote about his experience in Connecticut, in churches in Connecticut, in restaurants in Connecticut. He wrote about the difference that he experienced also um, on trains, that when he rode a train in Connecticut, it wasn't uh, segregated. And now over seven decades later, the House of Worship finds themselves on the front line of wanting to make a more intentional commitment to becoming an anti-racist church. Nearly everyone is quick to say, I'm not a racist, right? You know, meaning I don't use slurs and I believe every Everybody is equal and these kinds of things. But that's very different to just say that than to make a commitment um, to fight and challenge racism. And so they started a program that does just that. We have a team of people that went through a six-month-long training with people from other eight other churches uh, called a racial justice activation team. We have a number of programs that we um, offer our members. Also, we make a commitment in the greater Hartford community through um, a community organizing initiative in Hartford called the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance. But the pastor isn't afraid to be honest about the church's history. An early, early minister of this church was Simsbury's first slave owner. And um, we don't tell that story. Most people don't know it. Uh, but it's important to tell that story just as much as it is the MLK story. So we, we need to be uh, accountable with Jesus, regularly confronted, uh, I, and I will say racism. It wasn't called that at the time, but every time you read a story in the Bible about Samaritans, you can use that as an example of a time that Jesus stood up and confronted people um, about minority people in his community. And the ultimate goal is for people to comprehend. The real work is in us and better understanding the way we participate in systems that are racist and maybe are blind to them, maybe the way the stories we tell and the narratives we tell um, are incomplete because they don't account for uh, the racism that's implicit in them. And although the church has changed and the pews have been spruced up, the same message that Dr. King carried with him over 70 years ago, as he said in the sanctuary, remains, and that is to love people, to not judge them by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, and that real change doesn't start externally, but begins within each of us. Reporting here in Simsbury, Michael Fuller, NBC Connecticut News. Yeah. You fit, fit a lot in there. That was the, the, the fullness of that was, was just really wonderful. And talked about the racial justice activation team. And next week, um, that team will be leading worship here. So um, it'll be a, a, a good time to hear what that team is up to um, and all the work that they've been doing. Friends, let us now uh, gather together uh, as we receive our gifts and our offerings.
Now may the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not otherwise go by yourself, go beneath you to support and sustain you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion that you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved love beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen.